ஸ்ரீலங்காவே பிரதம வரட SLT 4G within then PO TV நரம்பன்ன இதிரியட்ட மகனேன SLT 4G லேங்கத்துக்கும் வெடிக்கிறகன்ன லாவுஜு ருப்பியல் பனாட்டாடுக்கலா மாமே என்ன அப்பிதேக்கு Tonight, Unite as One. Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa urges the country to shed religious and political lines to combat the COVID-19 threat. The good and the bad. Sri Lanka's sixth COVID-19 death reported as recovery rate continues its upward trend. Zero tolerance. DIG Ajit Rohana warns of strict prison terms for misinformation and intentional infection. Vaccines for all. WHO says vaccine development accelerated, but equal global distribution essential. All this and much more coming up on this Tuesday, the 7th of April 2020. From Adha Derana, this is Adha Derana First at Nine. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. A very good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Shanella Fernando. Moving on to your top stories for tonight. Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa addressed the nation this evening and briefed the public on measures taken to combat the spread of the COVID-19 virus in the country. The Prime Minister urged the public to shed political and religious affiliations and to unite as a single community at this time of great national need to battle the COVID-19 threat. लोकसाहूक की संविधाने सभापति वर्या जनादिपति तुम्हारे टक ताक करला मैं यहाँ पे वैधपी लोगों के प्रशंसा करा आगे कल बावा बोलूँ लोग के मदान हो मैं मोहते लक्ष्य मनस्तुन कर वड़ा जनता वटे राज्य रिजु सहाना दार लबादी लाई वराई मैं मोहते वेन कोटे राज्य टा आधायन लेबन सियोलु मार्ग अकार Mewagai tatkala kita itu thamai, api itu mewa sanggatnya itu mohon dengan sedih belati ini. Nuh api naya kian net naya, dana daripada bahaya kian net. Mewa satu nata hari net naya. Kesemua mohon tak api desa pal, jatik, agi muka wajah yang hitala, tiga duga ti naya, gan net naya. Selalu mewa desa pal na paksi naya kau, kita bunuhan dua orang raja itu sahaya dengan hidri patun mohon tak mewa. Mewa agi muka jatik wajah yang bedi benmi, hitana belawak nuwe. Apa itu main mohon tu? Inna pulau angin ke hatu rek vitalai, ek corona kian hatu la vitalai. Apa itu mana agi main unat? Mana jati ay unat? Minna main sattya, apa itu seru dina amit terung ganlo. Meka agi mukat itu jati ay kita visesh wamana, cari terawari ti itu kerana wilawa agnovi. Meka rata kena hitan wilawa. Podoe manusia nanti ay hitu hot vitalai. Apa itu main mini waleng? Ia ada pani inna pulau ang benny. Matagat ya gan. Daruo beri dha gedera ini di. Kawan ter roge ter mohon dina wena bawa dana dana. Abit rogi ente perdikara kerana wajib dewaru sah sauke karam andalaya apa ti ini? Hina terata vala mohonu esmak duni neh kela seve atharagiya hediyo inno. Namu tapi adam beru kian ni. Apa yang ada ini tamangge mohonu esma taman mahage ne? Abit tamu warga kimi itu kerana heda parapura. Roha lupas tahe. Gilan rata riya dulu. Kisi mar rogi ek atharala ne? Embadu rata kau betani benni ne? Apit diku kalaya gata keran ne? Natiwa. एक बनी मेवा संगत है जगह नॉन ये वाकई में वो आरक्षा करी मतलब राज्य का नुला बने सैम क्रिया मार्ग के कट में साया लबादे ले से माओ बगिंग खार में क्यों इल्ल ना the country's sixth COVID-19 death was reported today of an 80-year-old resident of Dehivala this morning who was undergoing treatment at the IDH hospital. Following his death, his remains were cremated at the Kotikawata Cemetery later on in the day under strict safety protocols. Meanwhile, chairpersons of specialist medical colleges in the country have warned the Ministry of Health of a second wave of COVID-19 infections expected within the next two weeks and called for stricter measures to control the spread. The sixth COVID-19 death in the country was reported from the Infectious Diseases Hospital this morning. The victim was an 80-year-old resident of Aruna Lokomauta in Dehivala. He was admitted to the Columbus South Teaching Hospital on the 27th of March and upon being diagnosed with COVID-19 on the 30th of March, was admitted to the IDH. 
The son-in-law of the deceased has been identified as a travel guide who was diagnosed with COVID-19 along with his wife and child. The victim's remains were cremated at the Kotigawata Cemetery in accordance with international quarantine laws. To date, a total of 185 cases of COVID-19 have been detected in the country. 42 patients have been discharged from hospital so far, bringing the country's recovery rate to 23.3%. Following the six deaths reported so far, 137 active cases remain in the country. 255 people suspected of having contracted COVID-19 are under medical observation at the moment. It has been four weeks since the first case of COVID-19 infection was detected in Sri Lanka on the 11th of March. 42 cases were diagnosed in the first week, while 59 cases were reported in the second week. In the third week, the number of patients identified was 41, and with the fourth week ending today, the week's COVID-19 count stands at 38. A team of doctors have begun collecting saliva samples of residents in Beirola last Sunday, an area classified as a high-risk zone. During the test, a COVID-19 infected person was detected in the area, an arrival from Indonesia who landed on the 16th of March. Identified as a resident of the Yasser Arafat Masjid Maut in Beirubala, he was diagnosed with COVID-19 22 days after arriving in the country. According to the Kalutari District Public Health Inspector, the COVID-19 patient had avoided quarantine protocols. Health authorities took immediate measures to hospitalize the patient. Upon scrutinizing his travel history, authorities identified many individuals he had come into contact with and took measures to place them in self-quarantine. A 43-year-old member of the cleaning staff at the Katanaika Airport 2 has been diagnosed with COVID-19. She had received treatment from the medical center located at the airport premises a week ago. Residing at a boarding house in Avariwatha, Katanaika, she had also attended religious observances at the Shailo Bimba Rama Temple. The patient had regardless travelled to work during the past few days and was reported to the police by a fellow boarder due to her worsening health condition. Arriving at the patient's boarding place, public health inspectors took immediate steps to admit her to the Nigamba hospital where she tested positive. Public health inspectors subsequently disinfected her boarding place and requested residents in the area to self-quarantine. Further, all individuals who came into contact with the patients at shops and at the Shiloh Bimba Rama Temple were also asked to self-quarantine for 14 days. PHI has also directed the family members of a 30-year-old mother of one residing in Kula Anamadua who tested positive for COVID-19 for medical checkups. PHI has also directed the family members of a 30-year-old mother of one residing in Kula Anamadua who tested positive for COVID-19 for medical checkups. DIG Ajit Rohana says that those who spread false information will face a five-year prison sentence once the battle against COVID-19 is won. The DIG also revealed equally strict prison terms against individuals knowingly concealing COVID-19 symptoms and infecting other members of the public. ஏம்கிசி Following the government measures to reduce the amount of public gatherings, government introduces four methods to obtain curfew permits without awaiting in queues. Government further requests people not to misuse curfew permits as it is a punishable offence. Following the gathering of large crowds at police stations to obtain curfew permits, the President's Media Division has announced new methods for obtaining curfew permits. Accordingly, the police headquarters will forthwith issue curfew permits to organizations with 50 or more employees in Colombo. The authority to issue curfew permits for the organizations in the Gampa and Kalutara districts has been given to the senior DIG's office in charge of the Western Province. 
The curfew permits for organizations in other provinces will be issued by the senior DIG's office in charge of those respective provinces. The police superintendent's office in the respective police divisions will issue permits for institutions with less than 50 employees. Furthermore, employees of the Presidential Secretariat, Prime Minister's office, ministries, departments, corporations, boards and authorities can use their service IDs as a curfew permit. Strict actions will be taken against people who are found to be misusing curfew permits. The circular, which contains the new procedures for issuing curfew licenses, can be viewed at www.police.lk. Curfew in the COVID-19 high-risk zones of Colombo, Kalutara, Gampaha, Kandy, Putlam and Jaffna districts will remain in place until further notice. However, curfew in other districts will be lifted at 6 a.m. on the 9th of April and will be reimposed at 4 p.m. on the same day. The government has requested the public to stay indoors adhering to safety guidelines provided during this time. Starting from 6 a.m. yesterday up until 12 noon today, 1,329 people have been arrested along with 399 vehicles seized for violating the curfew. During the curfew, police made numerous inspections island-wide in order to nab drivers who misuse the curfew permits. Customers standing in a queue to obtain kerosene from the Urugodavata petrol shed were made to follow social distancing rules of one meter as a safety precaution. <laughs> Meanwhile, officials of the Matara Consumer Affairs Authority raided the house of the Lanka Satusa store's assistant in the Tihagode area in response to a complaint that essential food items were being hidden at his residence. Upon inspection, a massive stock of canned fish and dal was found stored inside the house. It was later uncovered that the illegally obtained stocks were being sent in secret to a grocery store operated by the Satosa employee. Officials of the CAA seized the stocks and a case is to be filed against the suspect at the Mathura Magistrate's Court. In the meantime, three suspects remanded for drug racketeering have escaped from the remand prison in Nigambo last night. However, the police managed to apprehend two out of the three suspects last night, while the other suspect was caught this morning. It has been revealed that the suspects were residing in the areas of Nigambo, the Ulapitiya and Kochikade. Meanwhile, Norelia police arrested four suspects who were transporting foreign liquor inside a luxury jeep at Nanwaya. The suspects were remanded until the 16th of this month, after producing them before the Norelia district judge. We'll return after this short commercial break. Stay tuned. Nishwadi today ne kavada talu. Watta vela the aragan. Watta vela the Sri Lanka ve the nikha. Welcome back in more news. Following reports circulating on social media and in news regarding an order by the ruler of Sharjah, Sheikh Dr. Sultan bin Mohammed Al Qasimi, allegedly banning burials and instead ordering the cremation of COVID 19 victims in the country, the UAE embassy in Sri Lanka has lodged strong condemnation with the Sri Lankan government. The embassy has requested the government to take steps to remove such misleading posts from websites immediately, which it termed were was an attempt to incite hatred towards the Sri Lankan Muslim community. The Embassy of the United Arab Emirates in Colombo issued an official statement today clarifying reports in news media and on social media regarding a statement by the ruler of Sharjah, Sheikh Dr. Sultan bin Mohammed Al Qasimi. The reports allege that Sheikh Al Qasimi had ordered the banning of burial rights for COVID 19 victims in the Al Sajjah region in Sharjah and instead had ordered for the cremation of their remains. The embassy, however, refuted the claim, stating that it was dismayed and concerned about the reports, stating that the UAE had not banned the burial of victims, nor has it instructed them to be cremated. The embassy added that Sheikh Al Qasimi's ruling only pertained to the shifting of the victims' burial from the overcrowded Al Sajjah region to an alternative site. Further, the statement said that the UAE government believes that a deceased person's remains must be treated with dignity, regardless of the cause of death, without prejudice or discrimination. The embassy strongly condemned the deliberate attempt of what it termed an attempt to incite racism and hatred against the Muslim community and urged the government of Sri Lanka to take necessary steps to remove the misleading news from all websites immediately. 
The Confederation of Micro, Small and Medium Industries has welcomed the government's banning or limiting of all non-essential imports into the country except medicine and fuel. The Confederation called it a welcome step in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, more so for the revival of the country's agri-SME sector. Cosme founder President Nawaz Rajabdin stated that the government's limiting and ban on imports of non-essential items could help local enterprises looking to get into the production and processing of the items he added quote we believe this situation presents the country with a rare opportunity to kickstart the revival of several local SME sectors unquote he added that SMEs in agribusiness agriculture poultry and other livestock are some of the priority sectors that could make use of the situation given proper government support further the strong domestic demand for the produce during this COVID crisis shows low market risk supplies. In your business news, with the governments having rushed to secure US dollars in the face of the global threat to world economies from the COVID-19 pandemic, the IMF is reportedly preparing to launch a program to address the shortage of dollars as a backup to the Federal Reserve's own efforts to maintain a steady flow of dollars in the market. Reports say that the International Monetary Fund may launch a new program which will look at addressing a shortage of US dollars in global markets as a backup for the Federal Reserve's efforts to maintain the flow of dollars in the world economy. IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva is evidently preparing to offer short-term dollar loans to countries with insufficient treasuries to participate in the Federal Reserve's program that enables foreign central banks to exchange US debt for dollars on a temporary basis. The Monetary Fund plans to meet with its members next week in a series of virtual meetings at a time when 90 countries have already sought assistance to protect their economies from the COVID-19 onslaught and its resultant recession. The coronavirus pandemic has so far prompted a worldwide rush for US dollars, wreaking havoc on a global economy heavily dependent on the currency as its linchpin. George Eva warned on April 3rd that the world recession is way worse than the global financial crisis. She has repeatedly touted the IMF's readiness to deploy its $1 trillion lending capacity to fight a virus it initially failed to identify as a massive global threat. U.S. stocks rocketed higher yesterday with each of the major indexes rallying about 7% after a fall in the daily debt toll in New York. The country's biggest coronavirus hotspot fueled optimism of a leveling off of the pandemic was close. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 1,627.46 points or 7.73%. The S&P 500 gained 175.03 points or 7.03% and the Nasdaq Composite added 540.16 points or 7.33%. Meanwhile, Asian stock markets rallied for a second day today, buoyed by Wall Street's optimism of the virus levelling off in New York and receding receding rather in Europe. Japan's benchmark Nikkei 225 opened up 1.63 percent, while in Hong Kong the market opened up with the benchmark Hang Seng Index rising with a gain of 1.17 percent. In South Korea, the Korea Composite Stock Price Index rose 12.42 points or 0.69 percent. More news on the other side of this break. Don't go away. Welcome back in more local news rather as curfew continues throughout the country a number of services such as the delivery of pensions took place today despite the poor holiday meanwhile the covid-19 health and social care fund established by president gotabe rajapaksa continues to receive donations from a vast cross section of public and private sector organizations over the past few days Donations to the Presidential COVID-19 Health and Social Care Fund continue to stream in with several ministries, government institutions, businessmen, sportsmen and private organizations handed over their donations over the past few days. The Ministry of Defence and the Sri Lanka Police donated 6 million rupees to the fund. 
Public donations to the fund can be made to the Special Bank of Ceylon account number 8573737 Despite being a poor day today Gram Seva officers continue to home deliver government allowances for seniors over the age of 100 to disabled patients and those with kidney ailments The government has also continued the handing over of a temporary allowance of rupees 5000 to samurdhi beneficiaries who have not received samurdhi benefits yet. Meanwhile the Ayurveda Medical Council began distributing traditional medicinal herbs that can boost immunity to members of the public around the country. The distribution of these medicinal herbs commenced in the Kote town. The country's main vegetable distribution hub, the Dambulla Economic Center and the Kapitipolla Economic Center in the Uba province have been closed down until further notice. This decision was taken due to a lack of proper health and safety procedures observed by members of the public who frequented the centers. The risk of major community transmission in these centers due to the large crowds thronging the centers was also cited as a reason. In the meantime the Kurunagala Yakvila Vera Hara Sri Siddhartha Rama Temple donated food and other essential items to families of triforces and in medical services personnel yesterday following the lifting of the curfew in those areas. The chief incumbent of the Mirisavatiya Raja Mahavihara Temple, Venerable Ethala Vatunavave Nyanathilakathera, along with the residents of the area donated dry rations to 1000 low income families. With more than 74,000 people having died from COVID-19 while over 1.3 million infections have been confirmed so far, countries are ramping up research into finding a possible vaccine that could deal with the deadly virus. During the WHO's daily COVID-19 media briefing, Director General Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said that research to develop vaccines and treatments has accelerated at incredible speed but added that equitable distribution of vaccines must be made. the norm According to Director General of the World Health Organization Dr Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus more than 70 countries have joined the WHO trials to accelerate research on effective treatments About 35 companies and academic institutions are racing to create a vaccine with at least 4 having already carried out animal testing The first of these produced by Boston-based biotech firm Moderna will enter human trials soon. The unprecedented speed in research is thanks to Chinese efforts to release the SARS-CoV-2 genetic material, the virus that causes COVID-19. President Donald Trump meanwhile echoed comments made by Dr. Tedros on the speed of research in fight against COVID-19 as he called for people to have hope saying there's light at the end of the tunnel with coronavirus vaccine and treatment research according to Trump 10 different therapeutic agents are in active trials and some are looking incredibly successful with another 15 potential treatments working towards clinical trials White House health advisor Dr Anthony Fauci said last week that the first human trials for a potential vaccine to prevent covid-19 is on track with public distribution still projected in 12 to 18 months New York state last month began the first large scale clinical trial looking at hydroxychloroquine as a possible treatment for the coronavirus after the Food and Drug Administration fast tracked the approval process upon President Trump's persistent promotion of the decades old drug Meanwhile in Australia the National Science Agency said it has commenced the first stage of testing potential vaccines for COVID-19 The country's Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization was the first outside of China to successfully develop a lab-grown version of the virus to enable preclinical studies. Australian scientists also suggested a widely available antiparasitic drug, favipiravir, saying it could stop COVID-19 cells from replicating in a laboratory within 48 hours. Meanwhile in Germany new research has detailed the clinical cause and treatment of Germany's first group of COVID-19 patients. According to reports the criteria may now be developed to determine the earliest point at which COVID-19 patients treated in hospitals with limited bed capacity can be safely discharged. However, even if a cure is found, there are many barriers before global immunization becomes a reality. 
To that end, during a daily media briefing held yesterday, Dr. Tedros announced that the WHO will implement an initiative for the accelerated development and equitable distribution of vaccines, while vehemently condemning remarks by two French doctors who suggested that Africa should become a testing ground for any vaccines against COVID-19. Of course, when you see the number of cases, the African continent has the lowest number of cases so far. But that doesn't mean that, you know, the situation will not deteriorate. It may. Then on the vaccines issue, there was, um, I think, a comment last week from a couple of scientists who said the testing ground for the new vaccines will be Africa. To be honest, I was so appalled when we needed solidarity, this kind of racist remarks actually would not help. It goes against the solidarity. Africa cannot and will not be a testing ground for any vaccine. While we're looking for vaccines, unless we break the barriers to equitable distribution of the products, whether it's vaccines or therapeutics, we will have a problem. We need to address the problem of access or challenges to access ahead of time. And that's why we will put together a mechanism and we will appoint that will work out the details on how they can accelerate production, but at the same time, how they can ensure equitable distribution. When a vaccine or a medicine is ready, we have to be able to deliver it to all over the world. There should not be a divide between the haves and the have-nots. In your sports news, U.S. prosecutors yesterday announced new criminal charges against two former executives of 21st Century Fox INC, or rather Inc., and other stem others stemming from a long-running investigation of corruption surrounding soccer's world governing body, FIFA. The former Fox executives Hernan Lopez and Carlos Martinez were indicted on wire fraud and money laundering, along with Gerard Romy, former co-CEO of Spanish media company Imagina Media Audiovisual. SL and Full Play Group SA and Uruguayan Sports Marketing Company. Two former 21st Century Fox executives are charged with paying bribes to win the US rights to broadcast the 2018 and 2022 World Cup tournaments as part of a long running US investigation of corruption in organized soccer. Hernan Lopez and Carlos Martinez were accused of wire fraud, money laundering, and trying to get confidential bidding information for World Cups. U.S. prosecutors in Brooklyn, New York said yesterday that the two men used their positions in the world of international soccer so that Fox would win the lucrative rights. The charges stem from an international crackdown on corruption in FIFA, international soccer's governing body, that began with a pre-dawn raid at a luxury Zurich hotel in May 2015. The probe brought down some of the biggest names in soccer, including the oust of Joseph Sepp Blatter, who was FIFA's president for 17 years. With that, we wrap up tonight's edition of First at Nine. Thank you for joining. I'm Shanda Fernando. Good night.